All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, another mayor's report. This is the fourth in a series with the Holocaust and Human Rights and Education Center. Uh, the impetus to this was uh, an, an event that happened in the village of Marinick a couple of years ago, uh, and it was uh, considered that perhaps there should be uh, demonstrations and uh, smarter people uh, determined that, in fact, the best thing to do is continue education. Uh, there's always the term that we're all familiar with now, which is never forget. Uh, I would note that uh, General Eisenhower in World War II uh, probably was the smartest of everyone who uh, directed and commanded that the uh, American troops take pictures and photographs of the concentration camps because he had the wherewithal and the knowledge uh, to note that uh, in the future, it will be said that it never happened. Uh, one only has to look at the current events uh, in France, in England, even in the United States where people are saying uh, it didn't happen, it never happened, uh, regardless, trying to rewrite history. Uh, I think it's very apropos. There are certain things that happen, and I'm sure uh, uh, Mr. Medoff will uh, probably uh, note it, that uh, doing some quick research I noted the, uh, and I re didn't remember the name of the ship, but I looked it up today to St. Louis, uh, where there was a, and it's on one of these great uh, cartoons you'll see, uh, where uh, there were over 900 uh, German Jews uh, and, and a few other, uh, probably not, I think it was another 30 that were on that boat that first went to Havana. Uh, they were authorized to, to uh, debark, and then it was uh, refused when they got there. Uh, they tried to do it off the coast of Miami. Again, it was refused. Uh, and I think that the current situation is an exact parallel to what happened then. Uh, if we look what's going on in the presidential election, and I'm not taking sides one way or the other, but there's certainly, there is certainly a, an, an ongoing discussion on immigration to the village, uh, to the vi into the village, uh, and also the United States, uh, and whereby uh, there are very parallel uh, questions. Uh, we live in an age of terrorism. Uh, we don't know where should we travel. The United States Department uh, says don't travel to Europe, don't travel to Turkey, and so on. So there's justifiable on one side. But on the other side, uh, our country is based on a melting pot mentality that everybody's welcome. So I just think it's very apropos. Uh, I would note that uh, the best speech any elected official can give is short and sweet, so I will end it with that. I thank you all for coming, and particularly I'd like to thank Millie and uh, Valerie uh, for making these programs available. It's fantastic. I will turn it over to Valerie, or Millie. <laughs> Welcome to tonight's lecture. I'd like to thank Mayor Norman Rosenblum for his, and the staff for the wonderful hospitality that he always extends to us. As he said, this is our fourth event that we've collaborated upon. I'm joined by Valerie O'Keefe, who is the chair of our organization, right here in the front. The mission of the Holocaust and Human Rights Education Center is to enhance the teaching and learning of the lessons of the Holocaust and the right of all people to be treated with dignity and respect. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Raphael Medoff tonight, who is the founding director of the David S. Wyman Institute for Holocaust Studies in Washington, D.C., and author of 16 books about Jewish history and the Holocaust. Dr. Medoff is also the creator of Cartoonists Against the Holocaust exhibit, which you see here today, and author of the companion book by the same name. It's now adopted by teachers in Westchester County to use political cartoons as a way of helping students learn about the Holocaust. This book is available to you. It's available tonight for the, at a cost of $10, and you can, take, you can uh, buy it from Margo in the back on your way out. Doctors Med, Dr. Medoff's articles about these topics have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, and many other leader publications. And he was recently honored with the Rock Hour Award for Excellence in Jewish Journalism from the American Jewish Press Association. Before Dr. Medoff begins, begins his lecture, I would like to remind you that the annual countywide Yom HaShoah commemoration is tomorrow at 12 noon. We have flyers outside with a little bit more detail. <laughs> 
Please note, you may not know, that we have 25 rescued Holocaust Torahs that will be in a procession. They all reside in Westchester temples. There is a keynote speaker by Stanley Berger, who is a Holocaust survivor, and a special treat, we have 35 third graders coming to sing from Westchester Day School. So at this time, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Medoff. Thank you and good evening, everyone. Let me first add my personal uh, thanks to Mayor Rosenblum and to Millie Jasper and the Holocaust and Human Rights Education Center for making this event possible. You know, when I began researching the subject of America's response to the Holocaust, so this is back when I was a, a grad student in the early 1980s, I imagined it would be a topic that would be of interest to historians, perhaps, uh, but not necessarily something that would interest the wider public. I thought it would just be another sort of a fascinating little slice of history, um, but not something with any continuing relevance uh, or interest to the wider public. And so um, I have been um, gratified to see, especially in recent years, that the whole subject of America's response to the Holocaust is still considered very relevant by many Americans, including by the leaders of our country. And just to cite a couple of, of the most recent examples, when, um, when Secretary of State John Kerry two years ago was explaining to the U.S. Senate why the Obama administration was at that time planning to intervene in Syria, a major part of his argument revolved around the story of the refugee ship, the St. Louis, which Mayor Rosenblum mentioned uh, a little while ago, and about how America's refusal to help Jews who were being targeted by the Nazis was a, offered a, a moral lesson and a, and, and a reason not to turn away again when innocent people were in danger. So that, that Secretary of Kerry, talk, Secretary of State Kerry talking about something that happened you know, 70 or more years ago but appreciating that the lessons from that experience are relevant today. And of course, in the current debate over whether or not to permit uh, more immigration of refugees from Syria, again, we're, we hear frequently references to the fact that the United States, the Roosevelt administration, kept out most Jewish refugees who were fleeing from the Nazis during the Holocaust years. And without getting into the, the similarities or the differences between the two situations, I just want to note for a moment um, that these topics are very relevant today, that, um, that many, many of us look back now and recognize that there are important moral lessons that can be derived from those years and which should influence how we look at crises around the world and how America should respond and whether America should respond when there are the persecution overseas. So with that said, um, in my remarks this evening, I want to share with you some of the latest research and controversy concerning President Franklin D. Roosevelt's response to the Holocaust. Some of it my own research, some of it by other scholars. And I want to tell you a little bit about the, the controversy um, that it has generated. And I want to begin by, by posing to you a, a kind of a paradox about President Roosevelt. On the one hand, of course, he was um, known and still widely known as having been a, a humanitarian. And it was, it's very much a part of his legacy as a president that he was someone who cared about the oppressed. In, his, in fact, in his first presidential campaign, 1932, uh, FDR and his, and his uh, advisors coined this idea that he was the champion of the little guy that was a like a, a campaign slogan, if you will, in 1932. And so that image of, of the president as someone who was liberal-minded and humanitarian um, and concerned about the downtrodden was something that colored the public's perception of him at the time and for many decades afterwards. And yet, and yet, And yet he was the same president 
who in, the, in 1942 authorized the mass incarceration of Japanese Americans in detention camps on the suspicion, and I underline the word suspicion, that they might turn out to be disloyal, not because any actual cases had been uncovered of Japanese Americans um, betraying America or secretly being loyal to, to the emperor or having something to do with Pearl Harbor, um, but merely the suspicion that because they were different um, that they might turn out to be treasonous. And so here you have the, the most liberal president um, of our time doing what is arguably one of the most, um, let's call it illiberal actions um, in the middle of World War II. So I pose, first of all, that as a paradox. How do we explain that? How can it be understood that he would do something of that nature? And now we have a second, we have a second mystery. I wanna, and you'll see how these two are connected in a sort of a surprising way. This mystery concerns the immigration of Jewish refugees to the United States in the 1930s. You'll find on your seat, or in the seat next to you, a chart, and I'd like you to all take a look at that because I want to point something out. This is a, a chart from the Immigration and Naturalization Service covering the 1920s, 30s, and up to 1944. And it's just a lot of statistics about how many people were admitted, how many, this is how many Jewish refugees were, were admitted. Uh, sorry, it's, it's, it's immigration in general, but I'll, I'll show you the Jewish aspect in a moment. Uh, from all countries in the world um, th throughout the decades. Now, this was a period when immigration was, was um, administered through a quota system. In other words, it was a fixed maximum number of people from any country in the world who could be allowed into the United States in any given year. So for example, look down the first, very first column, country, go down to Germany, they're alphabetical, you see Germany. Now, if you take your finger and you move it to the right across the page, when you get to the middle, you'll see the figure 27,370. That's the annual quota. Okay, so that's the maximum number of German citizens who could be admitted to the U.S. in any given year. Okay, but now here we get to our mystery. Keep, keep your finger moving across to the right until you get to 1933. 1933 is the first year that Adolf Hitler and the Nazis were in power in Germany. And there's the number of people who were actually admitted from Germany in 33. And you see the number is 1,324. So that's about 5% of the number who could have been allowed. Needless to say, the vast majority of people who came from Germany in these years were Jews. So I'm going to refer to this as German-Jewish immigration because overwhelmingly it was. So here now we have a second mystery. 27,370 could have been admitted, and there's no doubt that there were people, there were enough people who wanted to come, because here I'm showing you a couple of brief photos of, kind of some of the cruel, examples of, of cruel, savage mistreatment of Jews in Germany by the Nazis in the 1930s. Here are, are Jews being forced to scrub the streets. These are, these are Jewish would-be refugees lined up outside the U.S. consulate in Berlin, hoping to get visas to the United States. Here's a snapshot of the infamous Kristallnacht pogrom, when mass violence against the Jews in Germany in 1938. The point is, there were a lot of Jews in Germany who wanted to come to America. There were 27,000 spots open every year. And yet here we have in 1933, only about 5% of them being filled. And just to illustrate how this was not an exception, but rather was the rule, go to the next year. Okay, so if you've got your finger at 1,324, go further to the right. Next year, 34, the number is 3,515. It's a slight increase, but still, it's a very small percentage. Go to the next year. The number is again a little higher, but it's 4,891. So it's still less than one-fourth of the number that could have been allowed. Now, let me just mention something very important about the American immigration system in those years. If quota places were not used, they didn't roll over into the next year. At the end of the year, they expired. So this was it. So if, if only 1,300 people got in in 1933, that was it. There were no extra places. That, but, but in the next year, you had another 27,000. And yet here you have only a tiny portion of the quota being used. In fact, 
in most of the 12 years that Franklin Roosevelt was president, in the majority of those years, the quotas were less than 25% filled. And the quota was never, the quota from Germany, the quota from Germany was net, was filled in only one year in all of those 12, and in most of those years, it was less than 25% filled. So 75% unfilled. If you add up all the unused quota places from Germany and then from German-occupied countries in Europe for this entire period, there are over 190,000 unused quota places. Okay, so that's nearly 200,000, let's say, German Jews or other European Jews, but here we're talking about German Jews, who could have come to the United States within the existing quota system and yet did not, were not allowed to come. So this is our second mystery. It's our second mystery. We have a humanitarian president, a president known and who por portrayed himself as a champion of the downtrodden, the little guy. Here, the quota system already would have enabled a large number, a much larger number of people to come. The, in other words, the quotas did not have to be changed. The laws did not have to be changed. The president did not have to go to Congress and ask for a controversial new liberalization of the immigration system. This was already in place. All he had to do, really, was tell the officials in the government, and in those days it was the State Department that was in charge of immigration, just tell the State Department, allow the quota to be filled up until the existing allowable limit. It's the law. There's no controversy. It wouldn't have been a big public debate. It would, FDR would not have lost any popularity. It, in fact, it, would, it would pr probably would have hardly even been known. And yet here we have the, the cold, hard figures here of the tiny, minuscule number who were allowed. So there we have our two mysteries. Now, these are really, these are two dilemmas or paradoxes that have haunted historians for decades. The decision to intern the Japanese Americans without any legitimate basis and the turning away of Jewish refugees, even though the law would have allowed it. And most history books that deal with this subject don't really come up with a, with a, a good answer. There's no clear answer. Now, part of the reason is because FDR was not the kind of president who committed his innermost thoughts to paper. Okay? First of all, he didn't tape record his Oval Office conversations the way Richard Nixon did. So thank you, Richard Nixon. That's a gold mine for historians. Unfortunately, FDR didn't do that. Um, he didn't leave a handwritten diary, which is something that Harry Truman did for a portion of his presidency. And again, a great source for historians to see what <coughs> President Truman was thinking at a particular time. But FDR didn't do that. So for FDR, we have a whole scattering of different sources. But I'm just saying in general for historians, it has not been as easy to figure out what FDR was thinking and what, what was motivating him if he wasn't putting it down on paper or leaving, for example, tape recordings. But even though, even though he made it much harder for his, you know, future historians, there is a paper trail. There are documents. Some of them are the diaries kept by senior officials in his administration, the lost art of journaling. Um, in, in that generation, it was very common for even senior government officials, including Vice President Henry Wallace, to keep private diaries, not, not expecting them to be published. Um, that was just a thing that a lot of people did, and that has been a great source for historians studying America's response to the Holocaust because we can look at the innermost thoughts of senior officials in the State Department and in the, in the Treasury Department and in the President's Cabinet and, as I say, the Vice President. So that's one important source. Um, but there's some correspondence. There's internal memoranda between um, various government officials and the President. And then there are a number of private conversations that President Roosevelt had with various people, sometimes with members of Congress, sometimes his uh, speech writers and others, where the other person kept a record of it. Again, not expecting it to be ever be published. So we can look at these sources and we can feel, generally speaking, that they're authentic. In other words, there's no reason to suspect they're trying to make FDR look bad or anything else. These are private, you know, private records that people kept, but which eventually, many decades later, become open to researchers, to historians. And so that's how we know, for example, some of the things that President Roosevelt thought and said privately about Asians, Japanese in particular, and about Jews. Now, if I read you 
statement like I'm about to read, read you. I think you'd be shocked to imagine that these sentiments could have come from the president or soon to be president of the United States. Sentiments like this. The mingling of white with oriental blood on an extensive scale is harmful to our future citizenship. Now, but this one, Japanese immigrants are not capable of assimilation into the American population. Anyone who has traveled in the Far East knows that the mingling of Asiatic blood with a European or American blood produces in nine cases out of 10 the most unfortunate results. Or this one, the Japanese are treacherous people. These statements all come from newspaper articles that Franklin Roosevelt wrote in the 1920s when for a brief time he was living in Georgia, and this is after he had run for vice president. So he wasn't some young strapling. He was already a mature political leader. He had run unsuccessfully as vice president. He was getting ready to run for governor of New York. He was living in Georgia because he was recuperating after, the, after he was stricken with polio. And he was a columnist for a local newspaper. This was not widely known until very recently when a, another historian um, researching the question of Roosevelt's attitudes towards Asians, Japanese in particular, um, uncovered these early newspaper columns. And in the night, this, these are from 1923, 1924, 1925, when there was a big debate going on in the United States over whether to allow Japanese immigration. So FDR was just weighing in on, on a hot butt issue of the day but expressing a perspective which today, of course, we recoil at because it's so blatantly, there's no other way to put it, it's, it's racist. These are, these are strongly racist expressions. Now, it, I derive no consolation from the realization that a lot of people thought this way in the 1920s. That, to me, is not, that doesn't help, really, the bitter pill here. Um, because, yeah, there were people who thought this way, and you know what? There were a lot of people who didn't think this way. Not everybody was a racist. Um, not everybody thought that there was something inferior about Oriental blood or that um, Asians could never be trusted and could never assimilate. Not everybody thought that. And it's, it's, a, it's a little frightening to think that, you know, a, the president, he was only a few years away from becoming president of the United States, and he, and he felt this way. Well, so this is an interesting new insight on what FDR was thinking about um, Japanese Americans in his heart, in his mind, at the time when he signed that order in 1942, when he decided that, that more than 100,000 completely innocent Japanese Americans should be put in detention camps, um, sent away from their homes on a moment's notice, forced to sell all of their belongings for pennies or abandon them. Because in his heart, apparently, he harbored a certain kind of harsh attitude towards, towards Japanese people. Okay, so what does this have to do with the Jews? Why, are we, why am I talking about this on the eve of Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Memorial Day? Because as I read these statements, the sentiments that FDR was, was expressing about the Japanese in the 1920s, I was struck by a certain similarity to, to a number of private statements that, that Mr. Roosevelt made in the 1920s and also in the 30s and 40s about Jews. So this is research I had been doing, trying to understand how he felt privately about Jews and how it might have, could it have, influenced his policy towards the Holocaust? Could it have influenced his decision to turn away the refugee ship to St. Louis? That's what I was wondering about. But as I looked at the things he was saying about the Japanese, I wondered. Because also, in addition to this, the statements I just read, there are a number of statements he also made around that time about immigration in general, about the danger in general of have, uh, letting foreigners into the country. That, they, that if, if immigrants should be spread out, so here's a quote from, for example, from 1920. This is when he was running for vice president. He said that aliens should be distributed widely, he said, into various parts of the country. Because he felt that if they were allowed to congregate, they would never assimilate and become completely Americanized. And there was no concept, he certainly had no concept in those days, that there was anything legitimate about immigrants wanting to retain any of their cultural heritage, but that they should simply become completely American and you know, give up all of their past. And, he, you, and he, there are a number of times where we talked about this idea of spreading, spreading foreigners around the country. 
Okay. So as, but as I said, as I was looking at statements he made about Jews, I was struck by a certain similarity. Because just as he was talking about, you don't want to have too many Japanese coming into the country, you don't want to have them mixing too much with the rest of us, you don't want to have them congregating in certain areas, they can't really be trusted, here are some of the statements that I found he made privately about Jews and about Jewish immigrants. In one case, he was boasting to an, uh, one of his cabinet members about how as a trustee at Harvard, as a member of the Board of Trustees at Harvard University, President Roosevelt was saying that when he was on the Board of Trustees, called the Board of Overseers, that he helped institute a quota on the admission of Jewish students into Harvard. He and, and the other Harvard leaders felt that if too many Jews were allowed in, it would somehow spoil the culture of the university. And so they had an unofficial quota, unwritten quota, but he was proud of it. It was 15%. They felt that more than that would be trouble, as they put it. I found a cabinet meeting where he had just returned from a, co a trip to the West Coast, to Oregon specifically, and he complained, and now I'm here, I'm quoting from the diary of his Treasury Secretary, Henry Morgenthau who said in the cabinet meeting, Mr. Roosevelt said, quote, there are too many Jews among federal employees in Oregon. I came across a meeting that the president had with a, a U.S. Senator, Burton Wheeler of Montana, in 1939. And this was in Wheeler, Senator Wheeler's papers. Senator Wheeler said that the president and he were talking about um, the fact that they both had in what they called English and Dutch blood. He said, the president said, we know that there's no Jewish blood in our veins, but a lot of other people don't know whether they have any Jewish blood in their veins. And he was very proud of the fact that he had no Jewish blood. It's a strange, it's a strange thing to hear a president um, in 1939 talking about such things. The, perhaps the most disturbing of these statements, and I'm now only quoting from a small selection. Um, there are about... 15 or more of statements of this sort that I and other scholars have come across in recent years. But probably the most disturbing was actually made at the Casablanca Conference. This was 1943, after the Allies had just liberated North Africa, including Morocco, including Casablanca. And the president traveled there and had a meeting with local government officials to plan the future of North Africa under the ally, Allied rule. And the question came up, the local local governing officials brought up the question of whether the Jews in North Africa, and there were quite a few, there were about 300,000 Jews in Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, whether they should have equal rights alongside their Muslim Arab neighbors, because they hadn't had those equal rights under Arab rule. So the question was, now the Allies rule, should they put in that system? And, and so here we have an actual transcript. There was a note taker from the president's staff. And so we have transcripts, which came out many years later, but the president told them that Jews in North Africa should be restricted from entering the professions, that there should be quotas to make sure that not too many of them enter the various professions. And he said this would, and I'm quoting here, this would eliminate the understandable complaints which the Germans bore toward the Jews in Germany Namely, that while they, the Jews, represented a small part of the population, this is the president speaking, over 50% of the lawyers, doctors, school teachers, and college professors in Germany were Jews. I don't, I don't, by the way, I don't know where he got that number. I mean, that's a wildly inflated number. But the president, the president of the United States had absorbed this absurd idea that Jews like, controlled these professions in Germany, and that's why, understandably, the Germans had become angry at them and were mistreating them. And therefore, he said, let's keep the Jews in North Africa from getting too much into the professions of law and medicine and so forth. It struck me that there was a certain commonality here. There's a certain common thread. That is the idea that certain ethnic groups, and here specifically we're focusing on Japanese or Asians, and Jews were inherently somehow sinister or dangerous, that you couldn't allow two of them, too, ma too many of them, too many of them could not be allowed to get into universities like Harvard, to hold certain jobs, to enter certain professions, to enter the country, to mix with white people, that if you had too many of them, that they would 
not assimilate, they would come to dominate, they would exercise too much influence, that this was not something that was desirable for the United States. So I suggest to you that there is a certain, and although it's not, there's no one answer to when you look at any of these historical events, but that there's a certain role that these attitudes played in decisions such as the turning away of the St. Louis. Now, when the St. Louis approached Cuba and then the United States in the spring of 1939 with 930 refugees aboard, it was front page news. It was no secret. It was big news. Everyone knew um, that uh, there was a ship hovering off the coast of Florida because it stayed there for three days. That's, that's the St. Louis, by the way, when it was docked in the harbor at Havana. It was first turned away from Havana. The, the passengers had, had, had visas to enter Cuba, but they were disqualified at the last moment, and that's why the ship sailed up to Florida and waited there. And it was so well known that even some cartoonists in major American newspapers commented on it. This very striking cartoon actually is the very first um, political cartoon I ever came across about the, about the Holocaust, and this actually is what set, uh, what, what, set also what began the research that eventually led to cartoonists against the Holocaust. I should mention, by the way, that my uh, co-author, Craig Yo is here with us this evening. Craig, if you want to just, uh, yes, thank you. Um, the research that Craig and I did for over a number of years, hunting down these kinds of cartoons, it all began with this powerful cartoon from the New York Daily Mirror. While the ship was hovering off the coast of Florida, the cartoon had a caption, which you don't see here, but it, was, it had a one-word caption. The caption was, ashamed, because there was an editorial next to it, and the editorial said, the Statue of Liberty in this cartoon is turning her face away because she's ashamed that our country, which once had welcomed refugees from around the world, and which, in fact, was a country built on, 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 re on refugees, um, on, on, the, on the blood, sweat, and tears of, of refugees, of immigrants, was now, in fact, betraying that noble heritage and closing its doors. I mentioned to you earlier that in all of the years that President Roosevelt was in the White House, in only one year was the quota from Germany full. There was one year. That year was 1939. So the year that the St. Louis approached the shore and that readers of the New York Daily Mirror and of the Baltimore Sun, in this case, were looking at cartoons like this. And this is a, you see here you have the image of the, the old medieval legend of the wandering Jew, but here cast in completely new, new modern meaning. As the cartoonist, who was a Pulitzer Prize winner, by the way, Edmund Duffy, in, infuse this old legend with a whole new meaning. You see the wandering Jew coming out of the smokestack of the refugee ship to St. Louis at the bottom. So while people were looking at these cartoons and feeling sorry for the refugees, it is true that the quota that year was filled. So what does that mean? Does that mean there was nothing the president could have done? That is, his hands were tied, quota was, quota was filled. But the public certainly was not interested in liberalizing the quotas. That was not really an option. It wasn't really like a, a groundswell of support. There were a handful of courageous cartoonists, and there were a handful of other liberal-minded people, humanitarians, who did cry out, who did urge the president to take in the refugees, let's say, by executive order. But it was not, it was certainly not uh, any, by any, any means any close to a substantial amount of, of the American public. So while we look back at some of these cartoonists, for example, and admire that they use their, their pens to, um, to try to arouse the conscience of the public, they weren't really successful. They were not successful at all. But the reason I've included a photo of the Virgin Islands is this. Because a, a presidential executive order was not the only option to save the Jews on the St. Louis, to spare them from going back to Germany. There were a number of other places where refugees might have gone. And so when I show you the Virgin Islands and I suggest that a US territory like the Virgin Islands might have been a place they could have gone, I'm not just speculating with the hindsight, you know, the 2020 hindsight from, from the year 2016. 
The idea of the Virgin Islands as a refuge for the St. Louis passengers was raised at the time by Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau. Morgenthau approached Secretary of State Cordell Hull while the ship was off the coast of Florida. He said to the Secretary of State, um, I see from the newspapers that the ship is here and that the Coast Guard is out there to make sure they don't get any closer to the shore. Why can't they go to the Virgin Islands? It's a U.S. territory. The governor of the Virgin Islands publicly offered to take them in. Right after the Kristallnacht pogrom, we saw the photo a little while ago, um, the Kristallnacht pogrom six months earlier, the governor of the Virgin Islands and the legislative assembly of the Virgin Islands publicly offered that they would open their doors to Jewish refugees. So there was a standing offer. And this is what Morgenthau said to Secretary of State Hull. The Virgin Islands is willing to take them. Why not let them in as tourists? Okay, they can't get in under the immigration quota. That's filled at the moment. Let them in as tourists and let them stay temporarily as tourists. Tourist visas are normally six months. Stay for six months. Maybe by then it'll be safer for them to go back or to go or if they'll find some place else to go. Temporary refuge. Okay. They're not going to come to America. They're not going to take away jobs from, from American citizens. They'll just stay there and they'll wait. And here's what Hull said. Hull said he had discussed it. And again, we have the transcripts because Secretary uh, Morgenthau kept actual transcripts of all of his phone conversations. Another great resource for historians. <clears throat> he said, and, and here's what Hull said. Hull said, I've spoken to the president about this. And no, they can't go to the Virgin Islands. And here's why. Because technically, in order to qualify for a tourist visa, you have to show that you have a return address to which you can go after your six months are up, you know, so that they don't try to, like, overstay their visas. Okay, but the whole point, the whole reason they're, they're, they flee from Germany is because they don't have a safe, safe address to go back to. So it's the ultimate catch-22. They can't stay in Germany because it's not safe there, but they can't stay here in our U.S. territory because they can't, they don't have a safe place to go back to there. So because of this tech, on the grounds of this technicality, Secretary Hull said that the White House had decided they were not going to let them in. And of course, as you know, the ship was turned away. There was a second very important episode concerning whether or not to let Jewish refugees into the United States that took place right at about the same time, just as this whole crisis over the St. Louis was unfolding. Legislation was introduced in Congress to allow more Jews to come in beyond the regular quota system. This is actually the only time, the whole time period we're talking about, where there was actual legislation introduced. So there were a number of liberal-minded or big-hearted members of Congress who introduced a bill. It's called the Wagner-Rogers Bill. Senator Robert Wagner of New York, Congresswoman Edith Rogers of Massachusetts, one Democrat, one Republican. It was a bipartisan initiative. And here was the idea behind it. It would have allowed 20,000 German Jewish children, 16 or younger, to come to the United States outside the quota system. Again, the quota that year was filled, so this is a special allotment. Why children? Here's why. Because one of the major arguments in those days against immigration, and I guess today as well, is if you allow foreigners in, they're going to take jobs away from present-day American citizens. Okay, so the refugee advocates, the Jewish organizations said, well, then let's just bring in children, right? An 11-year-old girl is not going to be a danger to anybody's job. That was the argument. Had the bill passed, did not pass. It was defeated, and I'm going to explain a little bit more about the defeat in a moment, but I just want to pause to reflect on this. Had that bill passed, among the children who, th in theory, could have qualified to come to the United States would have been Anne Frank and her sister Margot, both of whom were German citizens, right, under 16 years old. Um, the Holocaust and Human Rights Education Center is going to be presenting a very important and powerful exhibit, a new, tra new traveling exhibit about Anne Frank. It's going to be um, set at the, in the New Rochelle High School beginning in November, and I hope everyone here will remember that and have a chance to go see it. 
Anne Frank's father, Otto Frank, made repeated efforts around this time to get visas to the United States for his family. He couldn't, even though the quotas, and now I'm talking about 1940-41, when the quota was, again, 5% filled. Quotas were 5% filled, but he couldn't get visas. And the bill that, in theory, could have allowed his children, or certainly or other, other children to come, was defeated. It was defeated because in Congress and, and the public in general, there was a very strong sentiment against immigration, against refugees, especially against Jewish refugees. And I say that because um, we have one very, very vivid expression of the opposition to that bill, which I want to mention to you, because it really sums up the whole ugly mood that dominated much of the public in those days. President Roosevelt had a first cousin named Laura Delano Howdling. Her husband happened to be the U.S. Uh, Commissioner of Immigration. She was at a dinner party in Washington in April 1939, just as this Wagner Rogers bill was being discussed in Congress. And the topic of the bill came up, and she remarked casually that she was opposed to it because she said, 20,000 charming children would all too soon grow up into 20,000 ugly adults. How do we know she said this? Who was at the dinner party? Well, by chance, she was sitting next to a State Department official uh, by the name of Pierpont Moffat. Pierpont Moffat thought it was interesting that she said it, because again, I guess because it kind of summed up the sentiment. And he wrote it down in his diary, which he never expected to be published. I quoted that statement in an op-ed I wrote a few years ago about the Wagner-Rogers bill and why the Jews were turned away and so forth. And one day, a um, couple of years back, a couple of years ago, out of the blue, I get an email from a man who identified himself as Laura Delano Houdling's grandson. He said, I knew grandma very well. She did not, I'm quoting quoting directly, she did not have an anti-Semitic bone in his body, in her body. Dr. Medoff, I cannot believe my grandmother would have said this. You have slandered her memory. How dare you claim she said such a horrible thing? Um, And to my alarm, he CC'd about like 50 of his relatives. So I'm already imagining like this mob of angry howdlings with like torches and pitchforks on my front lawn. I wrote back to him, I said, I didn't didn't come up with this. At first, I didn't make it up, and I didn't find it either. Another historian, very distinguished historian named Henry Feingold from City College of New York, he found it in his research because he found this, the Moffitt diary, and he quoted from the diary. And I, I, you know, then cited it in this op-ed I wrote. I said, but it's in Moffitt's diaries, which are in the the Wiedner Library at Harvard, and and this young Howdling, grandson Howdling, was somewhere in that general Boston area. I said, well, you know, you want, you know, there it is. Um, and about um, maybe a month or two later, I got a second email from him. He said, well, Dr. Medoff, I went to the library, and I looked up uh, Pierre Pont Moffat's diary, and sure enough, there it was. And I could not have imagined my grandmother felt this way. Um, and I know there were other people in those days who felt that way also, but that's not much comfort, he said something to that effect. Um, Happily, he CC'd all of his relatives again, so (laughs) I was exonerated. But it's, you know, it's it's a tragic illustration of the public mood, and yet at the same time, I emphasize that just because that was the public mood, it didn't mean the president's hands were always tied, that there were options. The Virgin Islands is one option that I've pointed to. This is, by the way, President Roosevelt with, uh, that's Treasury Secretary Morgenthau, the only Jew in Roosevelt's cabinet. And he was a man who, in general, was not comfortable talking about Jewish subjects with the president. Um, they were neighbors up in Hyde Park, um, Morgenthau and Roosevelt. That's how they, they, they came to know each other. Um, but Morgenthau, in general, felt it was out of place for him to talk about Jewish issues. So he did raise the subject of the St. Louis, as I've mentioned. And then much later in the war, he did return to the, the question of the, of the persecution of the Jews, but um, not, but aside from that in general, he was very reluctant to talk about these things. 
at Secretary of State Hall, who I mentioned a moment ago. And this is Assistant Secretary of State Breckenridge Long, who was the, um, who was the man most directly responsible for administering the quotas, the, the quotas. But I emphasize the word administering um, because Breckenridge Long did not invent the quota system and he didn't carry out his own foreign policy. He was appointed and served at the pleasure of the president. He briefed the president regularly on what was done uh, to keep Jewish refugees from coming to the United States. And that's one of the reasons we know that FDR knew what was going on. He knew how the system was being administered. And he knew that the State Department was implementing all kinds of complicated and very troubling, let's call them bureaucratic devices to keep immigration to a minimum. Because when we ask, as I did, how is it that only, let's say in 1934, 3,000 out of 27,000 got it? Well, let me tell you how they did it. Here's how they did it. If a would-be Jewish refugee came to the U.S. consulate in Berlin in 1934 and applied for a visa to go to the United States, first of all, there was an enormous amount of forms and guarantees and so forth that he had to provide. But among the tricky things that would come up from time to time, just to give you one example, was the following. Let's say our prospective immigrant was married and had children. So then he naturally had to provide some evidence of his marriage. Let's say he had to provide a marriage certificate. Okay, in a normal situation, if you were living in Nazi Germany, that's not a hard thing to produce. But if you didn't have a copy of it and it's in the office of some extremely hostile German official, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to get a copy of. And if, and this was the case with a tens of thousands of Jews in Germany, if you had, in fact, grown up in Russia, let's say in Russia, this is the example, in Russia, and you had come to Germany before the Nazis rose to power, and there's a substantial community of Russian Jews living in Germany. Well, now Russia was the Soviet Union, and Germany was Nazi Germany. So if, you were, if your marriage certificate was back in some office in the Kremlin, well, you couldn't go back into the Soviet Union in 1934 and just get a, you know, get a photocopy of it. So here's what would happen. We have this from the files of the immigration officials. Sometimes our prospective immigrant would produce his Jewish religious marriage certificate, what we call a ketubah. All right? So this is a, a certificate of marriage that is sort of is, is um, completed at the time of, of a Jewish marriage along with the, um, the civil uh, marriage certificate from town hall, from let's say from the village of Mamaronik, for example. But, when they pre but if someone presented this ketubah, which in Jewish religious law was a valid marriage certificate, it was not recognized by the consular officials as legitimate. And once that was not accepted as legitimate, what did it mean? it meant that the marriage between this man and his wife was not recognized in the eyes of the United States government, which meant that their children were, were illegitimate children. And if you had illegitimate children, then you were disqualified on the grounds of having low moral character. And this is just one example of the kind of thing that would happen, and this is how they suppressed immigration so far below the legal limit. The final blow in the, in the immigration uh, system, in the, uh, where's my chart? Here's my chart. Final blow, let's return now again to the Germany column, please, and now go into the 1940s. The numbers rose a little bit. 1939, it was full. 1940, it was close to full. And then it dropped drastically in 41. And by 42 and 43, it's all the way back down to 5%. And here's what happened. Breckenridge Long came up with a very clever, to put it charitably, a very clever little device, which the president approved. It was called the Close Relatives Edict. And here's what it was. It was an administrative decree which said, if anybody from anywhere in the world applies for a visa, but he knew, of course, this would overwhelmingly apply to Jews, because they were the, the people who were the most f trying to flee from, from Germany and the Axis countries. If anybody applied for a visa, and if they had any close relatives who would be staying behind in Europe, so that's parents, siblings, children, 
That was grounds for automatic disqualification. Why? Here was the reasoning that Long presented to FDR, which FDR accepted. Because, he said, if they left behind close relatives, the Nazis might take those relatives hostage, threaten to harm them, and thereby pressure the new immigrant to become a spy for the Nazis. This is the rationale, that there would be an army of Jewish spies for the Nazis sneaking in as immigrants. And with the, and with the institution of this new edict, the Close Relatives Edict, that's why immigration dropped so sharply again in 41, 42. And that's why the numbers, the numbers drop so low. I want to conclude with a, um, a statement from the diary of Vice President Henry Wallace, who we see here on the screen. I mentioned some of the other unpleasant remarks that the president made but when, when it, about Jews in private. But what, it, when it, it was when I read the diary of, of the vice president that I realized that the, the similarities and the, the mindset that was driving the president's attitudes towards Asians and Jews, that it really was all of one piece. And here it is. May 22, 1943. So it's the middle of World War II. It's the height of the Holocaust. The fact that Jews were being slaughtered by the millions was already long ago been confirmed, verified by the Allies. There's no doubt about that. So the dire suffering of the Jews was well known. The Prime Minister of England, Winston Churchill, was visiting Washington. There was a private luncheon between Churchill and Roosevelt and some of their top aides, including Vice President Wallace. And Vice President Wallace wrote this down in his diary afterwards. He said that Churchill and Roosevelt at, at a certain point got around to the question of what to do about the Jews after the war. And here is how Wallace quoted President Roosevelt. He said, the president said to Churchill that the best way to settle the Jewish question would be to spread the Jews thin all over the world. Very similar, very similar to what he's saying about Japanese and other immigrants. Spread them all out. He said, we tried this in Meriwether County, Georgia, and at Hyde Park, on the basis of adding four or five Jewish families at each place. The local population would have no objection if there were no more than that. Now, it's not that there was an actual government policy to put four families here, four families there, but what he's saying is that only a handful of Jews lived in the area around Hyde Park, true, or in this particular county in Georgia, near Warm Springs where he was, true. And that, the president felt, that's a comfortable level. You could allow a few of them in, but no substantial number. And you sure couldn't let them concentrate in any one area because then there would be trouble. Spread them all out over the place. Keep their numbers down. Tragically, Franklin Roosevelt, for all of his extraordinary accomplishments, for le despite leading America out of the Great Depression, despite leading America to the verge of victory in World War II before he tragically died in office. Despite all of those remarkable achievements, still he, he was, I'm going to say, trapped in a kind of a mindset in which his vision of what America should look like was not a welcoming or inclusive America. It was an America where only very small numbers of undesirable immigrants would be allowed in, not too many Asians, not too many Jews. Only a small number, restricted, spread out. It was, a, it was a vision of America, of what America should be like, which tragically made it possible for him to rationalize and for his administration to implement an immigration system which not only turned away the St. Louis, the most vivid illustration of this phenomenon, but which throughout the, all the years of the Holocaust, when Jews so desperately needed a haven, and when only a small number of good people cried out, handfuls of cartoonists and a few journalists and a, a few congressmen who tried vainly, but in that dark era, when these downtrodden people most needed a haven, even a temporary haven, even in some far-flung place like the, like the Virgin Islands, no. That was too much. That did not accord with President Roosevelt's unfortunate vision 
of what he thought America should look like. Thank you, and I'll, I'll be glad to take any, any questions if you have any questions. Thank you. The mayor has kindly um, offered to bring the microphone to the questioner so we can hear, so we can all hear you. Could you comment, one comment I've heard over the years is that the president was instrumental in not permitting the bombing of uh, railroad tracks leading to the uh, concentration camps. Could you comment on that and what Roosevelt played and how important that issue was? Yes, but I'll only speak about it briefly because it is a very big, um, it's a very big topic. Um, the failure to bomb Auschwitz is, I'd say, along with the St. Louis, is probably the best known illustration of America's, we call America's abandonment of the Jews. By the spring of 1944, the White House knew what Auschwitz was. Enough reports had, had, had been received from escapees and from other sources. So they knew what, what was going on in Auschwitz. And by that time, in the spring of 44, Allied planes already had control over the skies of Europe. That wasn't true earlier, but it was true as of the spring of 44. So what that meant was that for the first time, it was conceivable, militarily conceivable, for Allied planes to, let's say, have bombed either the camp itself or the railway tracks. Jewish organizations in the United States were aware of the, of the fact that um, of what was happening in Auschwitz, again by this time, and were aware that Allied planes were carrying out raids on various military targets. And they privately approached senior officials of the Roosevelt administration and asked them repeatedly to bomb either the railway lines or, or the guest chambers and crematoria themselves. Sometimes they asked for both, sometimes one or the other. We have documents showing that these requests went as high as Secretary of War, in those days it was now Secretary of Defense, in those days it was called Secretary of War, Henry Stimson and Secretary of State Cordell Hull. We do not have evidence that it reached the office or the, let's say the desk of the president, but they did reach the two most senior members of the cabinet who were, would, have been the, would have been the most able and likely to have been involved in any such decision. So it, it got to the right people. Every time such a request was made, the requester would receive something that was very close to a form letter because when you look at them in the, fi in the, in the, in the archives, these, re these responses are almost all use the same language. And here's what they claim. We're sorry, but we already carried out a study of whether or not this would be feasible. And we've concluded that it's not a practical, that was the word they used, it's impracticable because it would require diverting bombers from other parts of the uh, other war zones to bring them to southwestern Poland to carry out such a mission, so we can't do it. Okay, that, that was the response. The response was, and I won't mince words, the response was a lie from top to bottom. First of all, there was no such study ever, ever carried out. Historians for 40 years have been looking at all the archives, and there's never found any, there was never any feasibility study done. So that's one. Two, the planes did not have to be diverted from other, elsewhere in Europe. How do we know that? Because at that very time, in the spring and summer of 1944, the Allies were bombing synthetic oil factories, German oil factories, that were located within the Auschwitz complex. Now, Auschwitz was a very large, um, very large area, which included the mass murder facilities, Birkenau, also slave labor areas, uh, including the oil factories. So they were manufacturing synthetic oil for the war effort, and Jewish slave laborers, by the way, including young Elie Wiesel, were working in those factories. And American planes were bombing those factories. Some of those factories were less than five miles from where the gas chambers and crematoria were. So for a bomber to travel five miles and drop a couple of bombs, okay, that's not exactly a diversion from the war effort. They were right there. About, I'll just, I'll wrap up this answer with this. About seven or eight years ago, my colleagues and I found out that young George McGovern, the U.S. Senator and 1972 Democratic presidential nominee, um, had been one of those pilots who had been bombing the oil factories 
next to Auschwitz. So we sent a camera crew out to South Dakota, and this was actually in the middle of winter, so I'm going to give them a lot of credit, South Dakota in the middle of winter, to interview George McGovern on camera for the first time talking about his experiences as, the, as one of the pilots who bombed Auschwitz. And he, they, did, they were doing they were bombing the slave labor area of Auschwitz. And here's what he said. And I'll just, the summary of what he said was this. He said, Franklin Roosevelt was a great man, and I, and, I was a, a tr and I remain a tremendous admirer of his. But we have to acknowledge that he had two great failings. He said one was the internment of the Japanese Americans without any justification. And he said the second was the failure to bomb Auschwitz. He said, because nobody can tell me that we couldn't have done it because I was there. I, we were right over Auschwitz. He said no one told us. Our commanders didn't tell us that, we were, that there was like mass murder going on down there. We were told to hit these oil factories, and we did. George McGovern. Yes, other questions? Yeah, I, I have a couple of, um, couple of comments here. Um, you emphasized the uh, lack of German immigration, how uh, the quota was not filled in the 30s. But if you look all the way at the top of your own figures, only 5% of the quota was filled overall from all countries. Mm -hmm. So that was a failure of American policy towards immigration in general, not well, necessarily aimed Okay, well, let me, let, me, let me briefly interrupt you before you get to the next subject. Let me just say this. Um, the only country in the world where an entire minority population was being savagely persecuted for reasons of their race, religion, and so forth, and who were in desperate need of havens, and who were trying to come to the United States were the German Jews. So the argument at the time was, yes, people from all around the world still want to come to America, of course, and, and yes, they were restricted. But there's a qualitative difference, I think, People said at the time, and I would argue, even in hindsight, we can say there's a moral difference between just letting people in because they want to come to America, can't blame them, or taking people in temporarily and putting them someplace like the Virgin Islands or wherever because they're in dire, immediate danger because their lives are at risk. That would be, the, that would be my comment on that. Please continue. My, my, my response to that would be that we always have to remember that first and foremost, Roosevelt was a politician. And... He always tested the winds before he, uh, before he implemented a policy, and he knew perfectly well that wasn't going to work. Well, wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but wasn't going to work means he President Roosevelt correctly understood that the public in general would not approve of, you know, of, a, of, a, of you know, large numbers of more immigrants coming in beyond what the law allowed. But my point here is that this is not asking for some new liberal policy. This is not, let's fling open our, our doors to the world, even though we have a depression. This was, this was the law. This was the existing number. They let them in in 39. 39, the quota was filled. The quota could have been filled in 38 or 36. You're, abso or you're absolutely that's, right. That's my thought. But, but uh, given the attitude of the country, uh, I, I don't think it was quite as easy as that. Uh, but in 1939, but uh, sorry again, but, but 1939, there were no riots over the fact that the quota was filled. People barely even knew it. By, 19, by 1939, everyone had heard and seen Kristallnacht, and I think there was a major change in attitude. But the, beyond that, uh, as far as the Japanese internment, one of the great blights on American history, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's interesting to note that the Supreme Court said that that was perfectly constitutional. Mm -hmm. In Korematsu, again, showing what uh, uh, what the attitude of the country was in, in general. And finally, True. as for bombing uh, Auschwitz, yes, they could have done it. I contend it wouldn't have mattered because the Nazis would have been just as happy to take those Jews from Auschwitz and march them to death any any which way. I, uh, but I, here's but here's the enormous here's the enormous difference. Auschwitz at its peak, which was in the late spring, early summer of 1944. When the Hungarian Jews were transported 12, there. 12,000 Hungarian Jews were being murdered in the gas chambers of Auschwitz every day. Yes. Okay? So had those gas chambers been destroyed from the air and the Germans had started the death marches earlier, well, there's no way that the number of fatalities could have approached, even remotely, the number that, that perished because of the gas chambers. But let me add here. You still have another not, year. But, but, but let, let me add. Let me add. We're, making, we're having this discussion in 2016. Right. That's not the reason they rejected it at the time. Exactly. They rejected it because they didn't want to divert even a minimal amount of resources, the most minimal amount, 
to helping stop the, stop the Germans from killing Jews, because that, that was an attitude, that was a mindset. It wasn't because, well, it's not going to make any difference. They, they didn't make that argument. It would have been interesting if they had. They made the false argument, we have to take planes away from the war zone and so forth. So it was a, it was a, it was a whole different rationale and a much more tragic one, I would say. Yes, ma'am. I'm curious about Eleanor Roosevelt. Did uh, you find writings, and did she have any influence with hit her husband, and how did she feel about it? So the first lady did make, I would say, a modest, a, mo a very modest effort um, to try to influence the president to take a more humanitarian approach. She did not make a, an ongoing or persistent effort. Um, the president was not exactly open-minded, and if he felt that Eleanor was getting out of line, he would tell her he was not interested in what she had to say on any subject. Um, you know that she stuck her neck out on a number of issues, for example, African-American civil rights and, and other issues. And when it came to the Jews, she made a few kind of half-hearted efforts, but she didn't push very hard. I'm not saying that in a critical or judgmental way, because it's, you know, it's hard to imagine what she thought was possible, how she might yet influence the president. But she tried a little. She didn't get very far. He slapped her down. I'll just give you one small example, by the way. She, she once went to the president, this is 1940, to complain about Breckenridge Long, the, sec the Assistant Secretary of, uh, of State. She said, Franklin, you know he's a fascist. Um, and his reply was, Eleanor, you must not talk about him that way ever again. And she was right, he probably was a fascist. I mean, to look at his diaries, he yeah, probably was a fascist. Um, and FDR was probably well aware of it. Why? Because they were old friends. Long was a close personal friend of the president's. He had been ambassador to Italy as his reward for supporting the president's uh, campaign in 1932. He was an important campaign contributor. Um, he was sent to Italy where Mussolini, when Mussolini was in charge. And he was sending, he would write back these glowing reports. The kind of reports where he said things like, the trains are very punctual, that kind of stuff. <laughs> he literally said that kind of stuff. And, and he was eventually recalled from Italy because word started getting around that he was kind of apologizing for the Mussolini regime. That's why he came back to America. And what happened when he came back? The president promoted him to assistant secretary of state, where he was then in charge of 42 divisions of the State Department, including the immigration desk. Yes, sir. Uh, professor, they're addressing that part of your presentation relating to the, uh, the Japanese Americans. There are two great ironies about that. The first is that the, uh, the public official who was charged with rounding up the Nisai and sending them to the det detention camps was, happened to be named Earl Warren, who became Chief Justice of the United States and spent the rest of his life trying to make up for what he had done. And the second is that Ironically, the most highly decorated unit in the entire U.S. Army in World War II was the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, which was all made up wholly of Japanese Americans. Mm -hmm. And they fought in Europe and won more medals than any other unit in the U.S. Army. And that was the one way you could, you could get out of a, one of the detention camps is if you volunteered to serve in the Army, yeah. which many did. Uh, just two questions. One would be if you could speak to the Evian conference and what influence Roosevelt may have had on that, and also on the culpability at the time of the Jewish community leaders, you know, the rabbis, and what they did or didn't do, you know, to help ease it. Well, on your way out, if you take a look at the first cartoon panel, that's near the, the desk at the entrance. That's a cartoon about the Evian Conference, which was held in France in 1938. There had been a lot of criticism in the press about the fact that no country wanted to take in the Jews. So President Roosevelt suggested that a conference, an international conference be held, excuse me, to discuss the problem. 32 countries sent representatives. Evian is, um, is a very um, pleasant resort uh, town in France um, where they met for a number of days and no country no country was willing no country except the Dominican Republic was willing to take in 
uh, any substantial number of Jews. Now, the Dominican Republic offered to take in 100,000 Jews. And this is a whole separate story, but ultimately the, one of the main reasons that, that almost no Jews ever reached, reached uh, the Dominican Republic and settled there, a handful did, but almost none did, is because the State Department objected to the idea of having a very large Jewish refuge close enough to, the Ameri to America, the American mainland, that they might become sort of like a, a springboard to try to get into the United States. So even that proposal never went anywhere. Um, the conference ended in a total failure. One pundit pointed out that the word Evian spelled backwards is naive. He said it was naive to think that any, any country would be willing to take in the Jews. Um, and indeed, it was kind of a foreshadowing of what would follow just months later with the St. Louis and, and the Wagner Rogers bill. The subject of the, of, of the American Jewish community's response to the Holocaust is, is just, I'm sorry, it's just too vast um, for me to try to tackle in 30 seconds um, or less. Um, but it is a, it's an important and painful subject, um, but for another time. I, I hope you'll forgive me for not trying to dive into that. Uh, can you shed some light on the fact <clears throat> that uh, you, these guys, like Breckenridge Long and Ambassador Phillips and Moffat, were known as rabid anti-Semites, anti-immigration, and yet they were in the State Department working for Cordell Hull, whose wife was known to be either half Jewish or full Jewish. Can you shed some light on that, how, that, how he permitted that to, to happen? Cordell Hull had, um, had visions of running for president in 1940. After, after FDR had served a full term, it was nearing completion of the second term, he had not told anyone he was planning to run again in 1940, so a lot of people were jockeying in the Democratic Party for who might replace him, and Cordell Hull was sort of a leading possible candidate. But Hull had what he felt was the skeleton in his closet. He was very nervous about the fact that it might come out that his wife was not Jewish, by the way, but was what we might call half Jewish. That is to say, his wife's father was Jewish. Um, it was not widely known at the time, which is why he was worried it would come out, because it hadn't really come out. It, it was not a total secret, but it was not widely known. And he was very afraid that if it came out, it would hurt his chances for, uh, for winning the, um, the presidency. Uh, his wife's father um, had been actually a Jewish refugee from Austria many years earlier. But when he came to America, he changed his name. He married a non-Jew, and, and his daughter, Hull's wife, was raised actually as a either Presbyterian or Episcopalian. So she wasn't an identifying Jew, and it was not, it was not well known. But yes, Hull was nervous about it. And some historians believe that Hull's fear of this being exposed affected his attitudes towards the Jewish refugee issue. In other words, that he was afraid, for example, with the St. Louis. If he bent over to let them in, that maybe people would say, oh, that's because your wife is a Jew or your father-in-law a, was a foreign Jew or something. So there is that possibility. I wouldn't say there's concrete evidence of that, but there are some indications that that, was, that could have been a factor in Hull's thinking. Yes. You mentioned there was controversy over some of your research and conclusions about Roosevelt. Can you talk about a little bit the other side? There are historians, I think, from Princeton and Northwestern who give a lot of credit to Roosevelt for doing the best he could with the War Refugee Board and some of the other things. So can you talk about some of your, not battles, but differences? Sure, but when you say Princeton and Northwestern, who are you thinking of? Was it, wasn't there a, a book by historians from those places? I forget. Okay, I'm not sure exactly what you were referring yeah. to, but. There, there was a book that came out recently that defended Roosevelt. Ah, okay, okay. I think so that's where they're from. Um, the research about President Roosevelt's response to the Holocaust um, has, I would say, overwhelmingly shown that there were many opportunities to rescue Jews, and the president knowingly chose not not to do that. Um, and so, until until the this re you know, a few, couple years ago, a book came out arguing the other way. Um, you'll find all of the, virtually all of the scholarship on the subject um, comes down rather critically of FDR. Um, the arguments defending the president are not based on the uncovering of new material showing he did something to help the Jews. Uh, I'll explain about the War Refugee Board in a moment. But they're based on 
a, a, an argument that it's not fair to say that in the midst of a depression or in the midst of a world war, the president should have or could have done something more. So that's the central argument. He was so burdened, he had so many other things to deal with that were so important and overwhelming that it's not fair to say he should have also done something for the Jews. That's the, that's the essence of it. Um, the War Refugee Board was a government agency, a U.S. government agency that was established near the end of the war in early 1944 for the purpose of rescuing Jewish refugees. So how is it that I'm standing here and criticizing Roosevelt for not rescuing Jewish refugees, and now I'm telling you, but there was a government agency that was set up as when he was the president to rescue Jewish refugees. What? Another, another paradox. The answer is it was established over the president's objections. That's the great irony. The truth is that the War Refugee Board illustrates everything that I've been saying here this evening, but I didn't have, you know, in the space of 45 minutes, you can't get all the way up to the, you can't cover everything. But late in the war, when there was a, a, a more sustained outcry from the Jewish community, from Jewish activists, and from members of Congress, there was a tremendous pressure on the administration to do something. And a bill was introduced in Congress asking the president to create a refugee rescue agency. And the administration lobbied against it furiously. And they sent Breckenridge Long to Capitol Hill to testify against it. And Long got up there at the hearings and he said, we already are rescuing Jews. He said, 580,000 Jews have already been let in since the rise of Hitler. So how can you say, how can you guys start demanding we create a new agency? We've already been helping them. Well, the 580,000 figure was, in fact, again, it was a lie. And it was exposed at the time. Because as, as soon as the words were out of his mouth, Jewish organizations were going to the New York Times and saying, this is simply false. The actual number of Jews had been let in was less than half, of, of immigrants that had bled in, was half, less than half that number, and not all of them were Jews. He gave the, the most inflated number for all of the immigrants from around the world who could have been admitted, not the actual people who came in, and not even just the Jews. And this caused a huge blow up in the press and in Congress. <clears throat> and this is when Morgenthau finally went to the president again. I alluded earlier to the fact that he went to the president on Jewish concerns twice, once for the St. Louis, and this was the second time. He went to FDR in the beginning of 1944, and he said, there's a huge controversy going on at Capitol Hill. He called it a boiling pot on Capitol Hill. He said, it's about to explode. He said, Congress is going to pass this resolution, and they're going to embarrass you, and this is an election year, and it's all coming out in the press that your guy, Long, just lied in front of Congress to try to make it look like you're rescuing the Jews. And Morgenthau said to him, why don't you just go ahead and create this agency, this rescue agency, in effect, throw them a bone so they'll stop all this criticism, they won't kick up all this fuss, especially when you're going to be running for re-election in 10 months. And Roosevelt, as this gentleman pointed out earlier, was, among other things, a brilliant politician. He understood the political implications of having a huge crisis like, crisis like this, especially at that time, and so he did it. He preempted Congress. He unilaterally created the War Refugee Board. Yeah. And yet, he gave it almost no funding. I said, how do you create a government agency and give it no funding? Well, here's what happened. The World Jewish Congress and the Joint, <coughs> Joint Distribution Committee, seeing in this a great opportunity to try to rescue Jews, they provided 90% of the War Refugee Board's budget. Roosevelt gave them a little token amount to start off, and he put Morgenthau and Morgenthau's staff in charge of it, thank goodness. But that's just because Morgenthau was the one who was yelling about it. So, you know, the squeaky wheel got the grease. So the right people were in charge. And even though the president gave them no money, um, and by the way, even the State Department and the War Department did not cooperate at all. In fact, they constantly were interfering with it. Despite that, the War Refugee Board performed miracles during that last year of the war. Just one small example of what they did. It was the War Refugee Board, which sent one of its emissaries to Sweden, found young Raoul Wallenberg, persuaded him to go into Hungary, and gave him the funds, coming from the World Jewish Congress and the Joint, to, do the, to perform the miracles that he performed there. Historians calculate overall the War Refugee Board played a major role in rescuing about 200,000 Jews in that last year of the war. So one can only imagine the administration had just been a little more humanitarian, a little more liberal-minded. 
If they had created that rescue agency just a few months earlier, how much more could have been achieved? If they hadn't been fighting tooth and nail to stop any effort to, to do this, how, much, how many more people might have been rescued? And we don't know the answer to that. But what we do know is that one gesture made for totally political reasons under tremendous pressure miraculously turned out to be one of the, v one of the very few things that the United States government did to help Jews during the Holocaust. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for your talk. The, um, there's always been said that despite what Roosevelt not helping the Jews, that the, the Jews, who were mostly democratic, were wildly supportive of him. And that seems to be a, a dilemma in China. And would you comment on the, those comments? I read very recently a, a, a very funny um, memoir written by a fellow, a, a Jewish a Jewish fellow who was very involved in the theater in Hollywood and the theater um, industry. And it was kind of it was a memoir of growing up in the 30s and 40s and how he got into Hollywood and so forth. And he was talking at one point, he just discusses how his mother had this tremendous affection for President Roosevelt, in which he kind of sensed was sort of typical of that generation. And here's how he illustrated his mother's tremendous admiration for the president. He said that. On top of the radio, you know, in those days, it was a big old radio in the living room, not, no TVs. On top of the radio, she had a bust of FDR. And he said every night before she went to bed, she would go over and kiss the bust on the forehead. Uh, I'm not going to comment on the whole question of, you know, idol worship in Judaism or whatever. But, <laughs> it's a, but it's an interesting little illustration, isn't it, of the great affection that Jews held for the president. And, and they weren't crazy. I mean, there were good reasons why. He was, he was a president who was perceived as leading the country out of the Depression. Okay? He was a president who, although he didn't take any action against Nazi, Nazi Germany, he did make a number of, of unflattering comments about Hitler, whereas the other guys, the Republicans, were the party of the isolationists, and their extreme wing were, f were flirting with, you know, with the reactionary forces. Um, and there were there was certainly a wing of the Republicans or in the isolationist world who were part of the America First movement and were even, in some cases, anti-Semitic, right? So the other guys were clearly unfriendly to the Jews. And the president seemed to be pretty good. And the whole issue of the unfilled quota was, quotas was not well known at the time, it was not well known to the public. It was not well known in the Jewish community. So on the one hand, there wasn't an, an obvious compelling reason in the Jewish community to feel negatively towards the president, in the 30s especially. On the other hand, the alternative looked even worse. So this is a very, you know, I'm standing on one leg here in explaining it, but this is a kind of a thumbnail summary of why American Jewish support for the president was so strong. And it was remarkably strong. We know from the, the, the voting totals in those years, FDR received about 90% of the Jewish vote each time he ran for re-election, which is the highest in any any presidential candidates ever received in this country's history. All right, uh, I know we can go on probably all week, but uh, I'll uh, take one more question if anybody has a quick question. If not. Yes, uh, sir, in the front row. You mentioned the big Churchill. Wait, wait, could you just say it to them? You mentioned the meeting with Churchill. Do we know what Churchill, what sort of response he had to Roosevelt? We don't know his response to that specific comment. Um, in general, the issue with, with Churchill and the British response to the Holocaust revolved around the question of British mandatory Palestine. Um, when Jewish refugee advocates in those days were speaking out, trying to find havens, very often they talked about, why not open the doors to Palestine, let the Jews go there? You have a, you know, a large and growing Jewish community, you know, a Jewish state in the making. Um, Palestine is a lot closer to Europe than the United States. So for refugees fleeing from the Nazis, it would have made much more sense to go to Palestine. But the policy of the British government, and now I'm speaking of the Churchill administration beginning in 1940, their policy was um, to keep the doors of Palestine almost entirely closed. And this one was the white paper policy. Almost entirely shut to Jewish immigrants because the Palestinian Arabs and the Arab world in general were so violently opposed to Jews coming in. So at the time when Palestine would have been the most logical haven and was most desperately needed, the British fear about Arab opinion um, shaped that response. And so 
Churchill, Churchill and Roosevelt sort of each had their own reasons, one might say, for enacting policies which tragically helped seal the doom of the Jews in Europe. I guess the kindred thing earlier was Churchill. Correct. And that's the irony, by the way, just to conclude with this. We look back at, um, at Chamberlain, and justifiably so, as having made horrible decisions that, uh, that strengthened Hitler and so forth, such obviously as the sacrifice and dismemberment of Czechoslovakia, the Munich Pact, and so forth. But ironically, the British response to Kristallnacht, to the Kristallnacht pogrom, was far more generous than President Roosevelt's response because the, the kinder transport brought 10,000 German Jewish children to England. In addition to that, not very widely known, the Chamberlain administration allowed in 15,000 young German Jewish women as nannies and, um, and housekeepers. That was their, you know, their, their, official, their official occupation. But again, in, basically in order to, to allow them to find a haven. So 25,000 young German Jews came to England, um, which was you know, a much more substantial response to the pogrom than, than Roosevelt's response to it. Thank you. Raphael, thank you very much. I think uh, this proves the point that old adage is uh, those that do not remember history are doomed to repeat it. So uh, thank you very much. It's a very important message that you give along with the, uh, the Holocaust and the, and the human rights education. Uh, I would note that uh, this book is available outside, which is very good. Please save one for me. Uh, and also tomorrow, uh, a reminder again of the Holocaust uh, commemoration. It is 148 Martin Avenue tomorrow in White Plains from uh, noon to 1 p.m. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Village of Romani, thank you for attending. Thank you.